this episode of the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing goal setting. Um, And Brian, we had discussed um, off air a little bit about um, how to begin this process and begin this discussion. Um, And we want to start by talking about the identity piece, that if we have a goal that um, we want to achieve, um, as for us as a tennis player, for us as a person, it's often important to um, start thinking about that identity, your identity um, as a person and really who you want to become um, and then set goals accordingly. Um, so for instance, um, in the book Atomic Habits, which I know we've referenced before in the past, talking about um, how if somebody's goal is to become um if somebody's goal is to run a marathon, for instance, you, you work towards that goal. And then at that point, after the marathon, um, what comes next? Where instead, if your goal is to become a runner, um, you may still be working towards that marathon, but that marathon is instead one milestone along the journey. So I think, um, you know, as we begin this discussion into, um, into goal setting, thinking about that identity piece and thinking about, okay, you know, where do we begin these discussions with, with players um, and helping them to, um, you know, see their identity in a certain way and strive towards a certain identity um, is often a good, a good starting point. Yeah. And I think um, one of the reasons the, the identity is important is um, motivation. I think when we often talk about goal setting as, as sports psych professionals or mental coaching professionals, it's, Really, we're, we're trying to help on that, that continuum of motivation. Like, why do you do this? What? Um, show up at practice every day, play matches and tournaments. It, it must all have some purpose. And going through a goal-setting process can help with that. And I think we want to reframe that a little bit because very often you're going to hear others talk more about, and we'll get into all what all these are, but, you know, outcome goals, process goals, performance goals. Um, and those are all huge parts of the process of being motivated, becoming the best that you want to become. But that identity piece is really important because, as you said, um, very often, let's say in, in your example of a marathon or someone wants to just run a marathon, and then they run a marathon. And well, then what? Do we just stop or, you know, obviously people might go keep going on and then and they'll reform what their goal is. But if they had a better identity to begin with, then they would realize that the marathon is really just sort of an interim milestone goal or part of the, that journey. So I think that is that is really important. And when we look at our vision of who we want to be, I think let's bring it back to what we've been discussing a lot over the last few months, which is the, the everything is practice mentality. Well, why are we looking at it that way? Because our overarching goal is to become the best that we can become, or you. And we're all different. So Josh's best, my best may be um, very different than somebody who is listening to this. Some people may have the ability to become top 500 in the world, top 100 in the world, top 10 in the world. And if you fully push that, then that's great. That's that's really what you can do. But if you set a goal of saying, well, I just want to play college tennis, or I just want to play pro tennis, and then you reach that goal, then what happens? Or maybe you, maybe you don't reach that goal, then what happens? If we're constantly pursuing, a, uh, I think, a probably like a healthier identity, which I think is where you're going with that, Josh, it can really um, drive this whole process. Um, we'll refer to it later. Eric Buderak, in his TEDx talk about, you know, don't dream big, refers to this when he noted that several of the other players that he was associated with on the sort of the lower level tour were not happy with where they were. They had all these expectations of being much better, where he, because of the way he was formulating his goals and and his own identity, was very satisfied with where he was. He felt like he was making it every day. So, um, so I think it is key that we, we start off with, with that process. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, 
part of part of his journey and, and part of what, one of the, the takeaways um, from that talk is, is to enjoy that process, is to enjoy those incremental gains along the way, those, you know, 1% improvements, rather than constantly thinking about, you know, how far you have to go to reach your goals, but um, enjoying that process of getting a little bit better each time that you're out there. So I think that's really important. And, and as it relates to the identity piece, um, yeah, it's, you know, the, these these tournaments that you play or, or each season um, might be um, a different milestone along that journey. But if your identity and, and if your ultimate goal is to become, you know, the best tennis player that you can be and to, you know, make the most of your potential, which is something we talked about recently, then there, there doesn't need to be an ending point, you know, each um, after each, after each match or each tournament or each new season, um, yes, perhaps there is that reevaluation piece where, you know, you sit down and, um, you know, maybe do some journaling or go, go through the, um, that, that process of, of reevaluating your goals, reevaluating maybe systems, what's worked, what hasn't worked, but there, there doesn't need to be an ending point there. Correct. Yeah. And I, I'm glad you brought up how Eric, Buderak said, you know, to enjoy that journey. I think he actually called it like enjoying the daily struggle, which is a cool way of putting it because we're not trying to make this sound easy. Yep. It is a struggle to get better in this sport um, because you have a direct opponent. They're fighting somebody that whole time. And, and tennis is, let's face it, from a techniques perspective, is not that easy to master many of the skills, uh, especially as you get better and better. So there is going to be, there's going to be some struggle along the way. The more that we can appreciate that journey, whenever we reach certain milestones on our overall journey, we'll appreciate that a whole lot more. Um, I think that is another aspect of, of goal setting, because if you're too focused on your destination, I think there's been a lot of research on this in all areas of human performance, whether that be performing arts, um, sport, business that when people are more focused on their destination as opposed to that journey, there's much less satisfaction when you have achieved that. Um, people who are more focused on the destination usually view the journey as painful. But people who can appreciate the journey can learn to, as Eric Buderak said, enjoy that daily struggle. And then when you hit and let's not call it a destination. Let's call it a sort of an interim milestone. When you hit that, you can feel much more satisfaction because you can look at all that hard work you did and, and, and take pride in that. I did that. And now I've hit this particular milestone. Now I can use that as motivation to keep going forward. And as you said, okay, maybe it's time to reevaluate how we reach this particular milestone, maybe the next one, we can do a little bit better and so forth. And we can continue to craft our identity of who we want to continue to be or become uh, in that future in order to hit the next, the next piece of our development. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps that's a junior player who, um, you know, you win the, uh, the, the sectional tournament in, in your age group, the, the 12 and under um, sectional tournament. And then it's like, okay, um, I'm moving up to that next age group. Perhaps you've played some tournaments already in that age group, but how do you go about um, thinking about what's next? How do you go about thinking about that, that next milestone and, you know, what we're striving towards now. Um, and then, you know, I, I, we can certainly talk about, um, you know, how long that timetable should be in terms of, um, our goals and in terms of how far we, we ought to look ahead. If we have the broader picture of, um, you know, trying to be a pro or trying to be the best player that we can be, um, you know, how, how do we go about crafting those, um, sort of mid, mid to short term, um, goals and systems in terms of tr making that a reality in terms of giving us the best possible chance to make that a reality. Yeah, and I, I think let's let's get like more specific now about how to create, say, the structure of a good goal, not only setting plan, but I think goal setting is just one aspect of it. It's we really want to think about achieving some yep. of these things and uh, because we don't want goal setting to be an exercise that you do once and you put it aside and then you never look at it. It needs to be a, an actual plan that's a part of part of your life. So 
we've been referring to the Eric Buderak TED Talk a little bit here. And I think as before we begin thinking about this whole thing, he, he throws out, a, I think, a caution to people about what having big dreams like, say, being a pro can do to some players because it then becomes an expectation. Um, now, not everybody necessarily wants to be a pro. They might want to be a, a Division I college player right at, at a Power 5 conference, something like that. And so that dream can at times become paralyzing to some people. And I see it working with a lot of junior players that that, that dream is uh, a huge inducer of pressure. Of course, it's self-induced, right? But it's the expectation is it's in the mind, and so that 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 particular goal or outcome is 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 really hampering, getting in the way of the player actually becoming the best that he or she could become. It it actually has become a barrier within itself, and I think that's one of the major points of um, Eric Buderak's talk is, all right, if that's a problem, we need to reconfigure how we look at goal setting and goal achievement and take it down to a daily level. What, you know, can I leave the court 1% better today? Um, And of course, there are goals that go into that, correct? That's, okay, what am I going to focus on today? What is it that I want to get better at? And I think when you just mentioned, Josh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about sort of like what's the optimal window to be looking out from a development perspective. That's, that's important because when we have big goals like being a pro or being a, a Division One college player or whatever that is, those are much longer term goals. Um, and if we haven't broken it down into smaller windows of development, then of course, I think it becomes overwhelming. And that this is where Eric Buderak talked more about the daily piece because that was not overwhelming. He could control that aspect of it. And then if he did walk off the court 1% better, uh, then he could feel some satisfaction. Okay, I did something today. I, I got 1% better. I had this feeling of achievement. And then he built day after day after day of that. And that helped him compound almost like you know, sort of an exponential growth in a way. To, to a life of, of achievement. So I think we want to make sure that when we look at this, if you want to be a pro, that's fine. If you want to be a Division I college player, that's fine to have as sort of a, um, a longer term thing. But you need to break it down into smaller pieces in order to achieve that. Otherwise, that particular goal could could create expectations in which you're constantly comparing yourself to wh- from where you are today. And you mentioned this earlier, Josh. It's not about all right, um, how much I can do to get to that goal today. Like meaning, how should I say this? Um, like we're always worried about the gap between where we are and, and where we want to be, as opposed to what can I do right now to just leave the court better. And perhaps that's part of human nature is to, is to look at things that way, to look at the gaps and get more concerned about the gap than about what you can actually actually do. Um, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on some of that so as we can just start to put together more of a framework? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple, a couple of different things. Um, comparing, you know, not being too fixated on the gap of, of where you have to go and, and thinking more about, you know, being able to look back um, to where you were perhaps a year ago or, you know, three months ago, or or even you know, um, a, a few weeks ago, if you're you know, on working on a particular shot or whatever it may be, but um, being able to look back and, and seeing how far you've come can help to be or can can be a, a driving factor um, as well. Um, and the the other thing that that resonated with me um, as we were talking about you know trying to get one percent better and thinking about that process of every day, um, we when we talk about um, controlling the controllables, which is certainly something we've talked about a lot on the show, the, those daily goals and those daily um, systems that we have in place, those are 
far more controllable than something more long term, something more outcome driven. Where okay, if the the goal is to become a pro, um, in reality, realistically, there are you know many certain things that happen to many players. Perhaps it's an injury that's out of your control. Perhaps it's financial burden. Um, perhaps. That somebody loses that drive. There are all these different things along the way that can happen that perhaps some are out of an individual's control. But those things that you do on a daily basis, like your attitude every time that you step on court, like, okay, am I prepared for um, practice today? Am I, am I well rested? Am I hydrated? Um, you know, did I, did I go through, you know, my my routine going into practice? Um, have I taken the time to journal and reflect on how things are going, how my training is going, how my matches are going? So thinking about the, the whole mental piece and uh, these, you know, the, that day to, the day-to-day, um, you know, these day-to-day processes um, is, is a lot more controllable. Is, are, these are things that um, set us up for the best possible chance to be successful. Um, we, you know, of course, they don't guarantee any success, but by doing these sorts of things, you are trying to control the controllables. You are trying to control the day-to-day, whatever's in front of you right now. I think when you create a goal-setting and achievement plan, <clears throat> that is the most critical piece. And because let's say... Uh, you, you, you know, you set up your vision and your different types of goals and, and so forth, but you don't do the part about the systems, the habits, the routines, then you've got really no means for achieving your process goals, your performance goals, your outcome goal. Um, and I think as you go through the setup, once you get to the systems, the routines, habits, that's all you actually need to focus on now for whatever period of time. Just continue to execute those things day after day or week after week, depending on what the system is or the routine is. And what you'll see as you do those things is you'll you'll be hitting your process goals. You'll be hitting your performance goals. And like you said, maybe maybe you're not, but you're certainly making more progress. All depends on how you're, you know, what, how you frame these things. Um, so that's really the key piece of when you go through this is, hey, this is who I want to be. Get it all the way down to these are the things that are going to help me get there week after week, day after day, bringing the discipline. I just need to focus on that now. That was the whole point really of the, I think of the the goal setting process is to get down to, okay, yeah, this is who I want to be. These are some of the interim things I want to do or need to achieve. And then I get to this last piece. Uh, that's all I need to focus on. And it'll all just flow back and we'll end up at a certain point at say the end of set, you know, like 90 or 120 days, I think that's probably when we look at development in a sport like tennis, that's probably the biggest window we should look at. And um, it's also very manageable when we, when we do that. Um, and then you reconfigure based on that. But those, I think that last piece of systems and habits is very important. Very, it's, it's the controllable piece. But many people, they'll go through a process of goal setting and then they won't do that piece. And basically, they'll just continue to do the same thing that they're doing now. And that's sort of that classic definition of insanity, right, Josh? You know, doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. Um, If we want to become someone different, we probably have to do something different. Oh, that's that's a great point. And... uh... Yeah, make, making those those small changes um, can can have that that compound effect, where it's okay that you know me trying to get one percent better um, over the course of a year, it's not me getting three hundred and sixty five percent better. It, it compounds on itself um, every day. So no, I, I think that's that's an important point there, um, and, and also thinking about okay, you know. If, if if we if we're working with a 11 year old a, you know a, a promising um, young athlete and th- that goal is to become a professional player that we're not best served to lay out you know step by step by step that entire process to getting to the professional level but instead let's focus on what's right in front of us let's focus on as you said that 90 to 120 days those few months out where okay why don't we set some goals in terms of 
um, you know, sit here are some tournaments that are around, maybe at the national level, at the sectional level, whatever it may be. Okay. And then in terms of training, how can we um, put in, in terms of the, how can we put in place those systems and those habits on a daily basis and on a weekly basis um, in, in terms of achieving in terms of developing our game and getting that little bit better each time that we get out there. Yeah. And, um, well, let's, let's say we're working with somebody, Josh, what would be one of the you know first things you would do to introduce them to goal setting and achievement to begin kicking off this plan and getting them thinking about this the, the right way. And so that we can set up a good, good framework for them. I, I often will, will talk about um, things that they've achieved in the past, um, you know, things, maybe it's changes that they've made, or maybe it's things that they're proud of, of achieving, and then trying to dig a little bit deeper into, okay, how did you go about doing that? What worked along the way? Um, and I think that often will blend right into, into this conversation and into um, some of the research that's out there and some of the best practices within sports psychology. Um, but starting with, you know, starting with where they're at and starting with what they've already done, um, to me, I've, I've found to be a, a helpful first step. Yeah, that's good. It also gives them a sense of self-efficacy. Let you're reminding them that, hey, you've, do, you've, you've already achieved certain things yep. to get where you are. You're already a, a, a someone who uh, has worked hard and, and um, gotten to a certain place. And of course, this is not your where you want to end up. We're not quitting. So yeah, you want to go on and, 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 and uh, help them realize there's more to do. Um, but the fact that they've done something in the past is, is a good reminder that they can do more. And like you said earlier, too often people are looking forward in that regard, right? They're not always looking and understanding, hey, I am better than I was three months ago or six months ago or a year ago. Let me use that as motivation to continue that process. So I think that it, that is a good a good first step. Um, I think it's as, as we've been saying, it's also good to help them understand that difference between yes, I want to be a college tennis player versus I want to be you know a great tennis player. Um, they are different. Um, you know, one implies um, well, you got into college. So what now? Are you done? And yeah, we were talking again before we started recording. We've seen examples of that, which are too bad, um, where players will get into a school and their motivation to play is not there anymore, much lower. I've seen this with, with a few players um, at the schools that I've worked at. And, and it's too bad because many of these players had great, great talent, but um, the purpose of tennis wasn't to become a great tennis player. The purpose of tennis for them was to get into school and, and that was it. Um, and that's fine. Right? It's, it's too bad because there might be some potential being left on the table and not explored. But that, I would say, is one potential pitfall of setting a, a goal like that. Because when you do achieve it, what happens? Um, and so that, that's a caveat. And I think we should all use as our overarching goal the idea of becoming the best that we can become. Always. Now, that may not be motivating to everybody. Um, but if you can use it as your overarching goal and then set these interim goals, I think that's, that, that's better. Um, and so when I start working with a player, we talk about all those things, how that keeps us motivated or, or to what extent it is motivating. But then we do try to narrow it down to the next three to four months. What can we achieve? And then the, the first step in that process um, is to start to talk about the player's identity as a competitor in different categories. So, for example, we might start with, we'll definitely start with the tennis skills. And I'll ask the player, okay. Tell me a little bit about your game, who you are from a tennis perspective at the end of say, well, right now we're in May, 2021, at the end of August, end of this the summer, tell me a little bit about your game. What are some of the things that you'd like to see? And so a player might say, well, I've been working on my serve, so I'd like my serve to be more of a weapon. 
I'd like it to be something that I can start a point off with and begin dictating play a little bit more. Uh, maybe it's a shot that gives me some, some free points. Um, I'd like my forehand to be a little bit heavier, a little bit more powerful. Things like that. And they're saying those things in the, in the first person. So they do that for the tennis skills. They do it for their um, conditioning, the strength and conditioning. They do it for the mental emotional skills. And then they would do it for um, various character skills. I try to emphasize uh, making ethical character skills uh, a big part of this. So things like um, respect, integrity, um, fairness as part of that, <clears throat> as well as some individual character skills like love of learning, um, creativity, persistence, perseverance um, as things to work in there. Because those, all of those things I think are really important to being a great competitor. Um, now, there might be other categories that I'm missing there, but I think that's a good framework to begin. But it also gets players thinking differently because most players will only think of the tennis piece. They won't always think of their physical development. They definitely don't think a whole lot about their mental and emotional skills as being a part of it. Um, and, and rarely will they think of their character skills. So to me, that's one of, you know, after going through what you said, um, really now starting to create that who. Who do I want to be in the next four months is, is a, to me, a key starting point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like that. And I, I would agree that that's something that is not utilized in, enough in terms of how um, how players are, are thinking about their development and thinking about what needs to be done or what, what they, they ought to focus on to get where they, they want to get in terms of um, maybe it's a, an outcome goal that they have. Um, but they're, they're, I, I would agree that that, that side is often um, neglected. So I, I think that's that's an important point. Um, I, I think also um, trying to be speci as specific as possible um, about, about some of these goals. I mean, we talk about performance goals and trying to, um, you know, be, be specific and be measurable um, on, on some of these things like, okay, if, if that goal is, um, for, for instance, to make my serve more of a weapon, okay, what does that, what does that look like? Um, is, you know, th does that, does that mean I'm trying to add an additional five to 10 miles per hour on my serve over the next three to four months? Um, and then, okay, how do I, how do I get there? Does that include some time in the gym? Does that include, um, you know, me practicing my serve with a, a basket of balls, you know, a few times a week and just dedicating that time to it? Does it involve, um, you know, me trying to learn about some of the great servers um, and in terms of what they've done well that has helped them? Um, you know, learning how Andy Roddick generates pace, for instance. Um, and I, I think another, another point that... Um, uh, and, and I would also add in that as it relates to these character skills, um, it's going to look a little bit different about how to be specific, but, um, you know, trying to go through that, that smart goals framework in terms of some of these best practices in terms of, um, uh, making the, the goals more likely to attain them. Um, so, uh, the, the other thing that I would add, and, and this just came to mind, and I don't think we've talked about this at all, um, especially with the, the French Open around the corner, um, is Dominic Team, And uh, I'm sure many of our listeners are aware he's been pretty public recently about some of the struggles that he's been going through. Um, and he talked about how for many years he had this goal of, you know, winning a Grand Slam. And uh, he ultimately ultimately did last, uh, you know, last, last fall and, and beat um, Alexander Zverev in a match that, was memorable. Um, uh, and, you know, I, he, I, I think he was, you know, very open and, and vulnerable in, in terms of saying, you know, talking about that struggle and in almost saying, Hey, I'm, I'm 27 years old. I've, you know, been working towards this for a long time. Um, and, you know, sort of almost struggling to find what comes next. And I, I, that was only part of it. I mean, the, the pandemic and, you know, all the uncertainty of the tennis calendar was certainly part of it, but I think it, it touches on the, 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 the same idea that um, if our goals are too much based on what, you know, a, a achieving one thing or, you know, that, that one tournament or, okay, I'm, I'm trying to become a professional. I'm trying to get that 
college scholarship that it can be challenging to reassess and reevaluate once you've gotten there um, rather than that lifelong process of becoming the best that you can be, um, which, which to me reminds me of our first interview from our, our second episode with, with Brian Barker, how it's, you know, it, it should be, the goal should be to be the best possible person that you can be. And that includes you being the best possible tennis player. That includes all the character pieces that you touched upon um, within that goal setting process. And I love that, that you include that um, makes me think that I, I could certainly be doing more of that myself when, when working with players um, and, you know, thinking about, okay, if, if that goal is to be the best person I can be to fulfill my potential in you know, in all these different ways, including on the court, including um, in the classroom, including, you know, at my job or whatever it is. Okay. If we're starting there, then it becomes so much easier to put um, those smaller pieces into play. Thinking about those performance goals, thinking about those process goals and those processes and systems that are going to help us to get closer and closer to that vision of being the best possible person or best possible tennis player we can be. Yeah. Before we move on, Josh, because you refer to this, the smart goal piece, can you like break that down for everybody? Because I'm not, not everyone may be familiar with that particular framework. Sure, sure. And we were talking a little bit off air that, um, you know, that there are different, um, d- d- for, for each of the five letters, the S-M-A-R-T, there, um, for at least a couple of them, there are some, some different words that have been used, but um, generally, and you know, the the way that USTA Mental Skills and Drills Handbook has broken it down, and in a lot of places has broken it down, is the S is for specific, trying to um, you know use the framework that any goal we should we want to really be specific in, in breaking it down, um, be very specific about what we want. Um, it should be measurable. It should include you know performance. Um, specific performance metrics that it's easy to tell whether or not they have been achieved. Um, not that the entire goal should be, um, did I, did I win the level one tournament? Um, that's certainly measurable, but they're by having measurable components within that, um, certain performance metrics, um, attainable, uh, is, is the A. Um, and again, there's, there's other, uh, models that use other A's like, like adjustable, um, but attainable being that we're, we don't want the goal to be um, so so broad and you know overly ambitious to the point where it can actually, like what Eric Buderek was saying, to the point where it actually can be discouraging and demotivating. Um, but you know something that feels attainable to us, um, relevant to what we want to achieve as well would be the R. Um, other models have used R as realistic. Um, which would you know be similar to that attainable piece, and then T being um, timely or time based, um, meaning that this this goal does does have to have a um, an end date. This we we should be looking at it in terms of you know breaking down our goals into um, short term, medium you know medium term in terms of that three to four month timetable you touched upon and then our longer term goals as well. But utilizing this, this framework, I think can, can certainly be possible. And then um, if, if we have a goal and, you know, we've, we've broken it down, being able to use a framework um, of these five pieces and thinking, okay, are our goals falling short in any of these areas or are we, um, you know, do we have to, should we make some adjustments in terms of uh, making sure that we hit on all these major points? I think it's a good framework as you go through the whole goal setting piece, as you said. Um, you don't have to have everything there based on the whole smart piece. But as you look at your whole plan, you want to make sure that um, the plan sort of builds up to make it feel like this is a smart plan for who I want to become. Um, because even you know, as we're talking about your vision, your vision, I would say, is an outcome goal, the vision of who you want to be. Um, but some of that is very subjective in a way. And, you know, if I say I want to have a serve that's such and such, um, that in itself may be subjective, right? That's a dictating serve or, 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 you know, it gets me more free points. But as I go through and I break this 
that particular piece of my vision down, I'm going to think about, okay, I might think about the process goals first um, in terms of the things I may want to focus on and or improve. So if I want to have a bigger serve, you mentioned this a little bit of this already, that might have a strength and conditioning component. It may have a technique component to it um, that helps. Like So yeah, the anti-erotic serve, which I don't think we see as many people using anymore with that particular way of approaching it. I actually tried that a few years ago and uh, I did find it helped with my power. Um, so yeah, maybe looking into that. But So there might be technique improvements. And uh, then the next thing you might look at is then per performance goals. Okay. Am I looking for miles per hour? Am I looking for, it doesn't even have to be match things. It could be you give yourself some tests and practice. So for example, let's say I wanted to be more accurate. I could set up some zones in the service box and say, all right, I'm going to do a test here of 20 serves. And all right, how many do I, of that 20, do I get in the, in the, in the, the zone that I'm aiming for? I can record that as my baseline number and then retest myself perhaps every week or every other day or something that gives me some data to look at that helps me understand, okay, am I making progress on this? So you can be creative with some of the performance stuff by giving yourself some data tests during practice. And then once you have those things, then I think it comes down to what you were saying earlier. All right, what are... What are some of the things I need to do on a daily and weekly basis that help me improve my technique, help me improve my power, help me um, reach these performance goals? And it could be some of the things that you're doing already. If you're you know, going to a clinic, working with a coach, um, but maybe it's going to be more about bringing more focus to some of those tennis items. Maybe you do need to add some special time with the serve where you're going to do it for 20 to 30 minutes on your own. Maybe it's about watching more video on serve technique or being inspired by, say, a Pete Sampras or someone who has a great serve that is perhaps something that you're trying to mimic or mirror in a way. Um, so I think when we look at, it's almost like in those different maybe columns, starting off with who you want to be, then working on the process of getting to that, then what are some performance goals that you can use to help measure how you're doing, and then ultimately designing the systems, the routines, the habits that will help you achieve all of those things. That to me is the fully functioning package that you can then begin working with on, you know, on a three to four month basis. But you also want to make sure that you're doing some course corrections along the way. Things may happen. As you mentioned, injuries or other things may occur. Um, and it's very similar to when you know somebody flies a plane. You don't just set the course and it ends up where you want it to end up. There are constantly little course corrections. And so you want to be looking at your plan in a similar way. Okay, maybe something has changed here. And uh, for some reason, we can't work on this part of my vision this in this period of time. So we're going to change that. So I want to make sure that the, the uh, goal plan is a real part of your training um, and that you're looking at it all the time. And, and if you have a coach, be looking at it with, with your coach. Um, get feedback from your coach on, on all of these different aspects of the plan. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like that you, you brought up the adjustment piece in terms of, um, and, and I think that that analogy of, you know, a, a pilot having, you know, you, you don't just set the, the plane into, to, um, to autopilot and, and just let it, let it run its course. You, you do make adjustments along the way. Um, sometimes those adjustments might be, um, you know, some, adjusting the goal itself sometimes it must it might be okay we need a break we don't want to burn out here we're feeling like we're overdoing it maybe we need a break or maybe we need to adjust the amount of times per week that we're training or we need to shift actually you know that that day-to-day -day on court what we're doing or it's the strength and conditioning piece or it's the mental piece or whatever it may be but being able to look back at it 
um, in a non-judgmental way and trying to look at, okay, um, we set this, this uh, three to four month goal, this 90 um, day uh, plan, let's, let's say, um, and being able to look back at that, okay, do we need to, uh, are things going according to plan? Are we going about, are these um, processes that we put in place serving me to um, getting closer to where I want to be? Um, or do adjustments need to be made? And I think getting, um, you know, getting different members of the quote unquote team involved, um, it can be helpful here. So maybe it's the player, maybe it's the coach, could be a parent, um, whoever is a part of that team, um, just so everyone's on the same page and uh, going through that, right, you know, going through that process together of writing that plan, and then also of adjusting that plan. Um, sometimes this can be, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen type of thing and too many voices in the room or too many opinions. But um, I, it is important for everyone to be on the same page and to understand what's going on. And if adjustments are made, um, you know, sometimes the rationale for those adjustments and just so that everyone can move forward in, in the best possible way together as, as a team. Yeah. Everybody has a performance team. Certainly the pros do. You, you see their entourages in the box. But even even those of us who are not pros, we, we probably are dealing with some coaches. Um, some of us may have strength and conditioning people or sports site people, or you, perhaps you see a massage therapist on a regular basis. Right, There are people all around us. There are family and friends or support system. I think it's key, though, as players, we remember more or less we're the boss. So we have to be comfortable with with all of that. We have to trust the people that quote unquote work for us, that they're giving us good advice. So we want their input into that whole thing. But ultimately, um, you know, you as the player, you're, you're more or less the CEO of the whole operation and, um, and understand that we're all working toward the same thing, which is to help you become the best that you can become. And the more that we can do that, from sort of an egoless perspective, right? It's about me becoming the best I can be. I don't have to be right about everything. <clears throat> it's it's about can I just be following the advice of of everybody on my team? Um, and yeah, maybe you have to put more stock into a, your primary coach. Some of you know there are a lot of great coaches out there who can help manage a lot of these these different things. Um, so that is certainly an important part of the, the goal achievement process. Um, but everyone who is playing or who is listening to this, I think should try this, is to think about who do you want to be in the next three to four months? Write that out in, some, in terms of some of those things. Um, and then and really think about that. How, do, how would you go about achieving that? Um, because I think... Most people, they just do what they do. They just, they play tennis, they, you know, play a certain number of times a week and, um, and, and so forth. And not everybody has to, you know, actively go out and, and try to become this great player. Although I think, why not? It's still fun to do that. And if you're doing this on a very, you know, a smaller basis and you don't have to tell people that I'm going to be a pro or anything, um, there's nothing to feel bad about per se, um, so even if you're an adult player, in fact, a lot of the adult players that I've worked with, Josh, I don't know, have you, have you experienced this? They've been some of the best students or clients I've had because they've probably been successful in other areas of their life. So they really get this stuff. And now they're looking at tennis in a whole new way. And the dedication that many of those players have shown to their improvement, regardless of what level they're at, uh, has been really impressive to see. So I think this is something that anyone can do. And I think it will actually make tennis more fun for you because you're giving yourself a challenge again. And now we're going back to the motivational aspect, which was sort of the, the whole purpose of, you know, why play? Well, I'm, I'm playing so I can become better, constantly improving. And I don't know, Playing better feels like it's more fun. No, I'm I'm glad that glad that you brought up um, that that piece of, of adult players, and uh, I've definitely have found that 
um, as well that, um, you know, talking about how I'll often, you know, we'll, we'll talk with people about some, some past things that they have achieved um, or, you know, would like to achieve. And I think that the difference between working with um, a junior on this, where maybe if they're really dedicated to their sport, most of their achievements are within that sport and comparing that to um, an adult who has had a lot more life experience, uh, maybe experience, you know, experience or successes within their professional career, their personal life um, on the tennis court, or maybe other sports as well. Um, I, I know we've talked and to talk to um, Brian about uh, the, the course that I'm doing currently at the, at the tennis hall of fame, the, the sports psychology course. And uh, we have a, in a small, small group of, of five adults who are, are in that group, you know, highly driven towards, um, you know, achieving more and more on the court. Um, people, you know, are, are talking about setting goals in terms of national rankings for their age groups and, uh, you know, really are highly motivated in, in terms of, of achieving them and, and feel that, um, you know, they, they, they've gotten to the point where um, it's, they, they've, at least for a couple of them, you know, they've gotten to their point where they've dedicated and invested significant time, energy, money to pursuing this goal because they, they've really determined that it's something important for them. Um, and w w with that security of, you know, feeling like, um, you know, they, I guess with a certain security of themselves that they, they don't feel that, um, you know, that this goal is, um, something that they that they need to do, but it's something that they want to pursue, and they the the motivation that they've shown, and, and as well as other other adults as well, um, and and I I would go back to that that first piece that you know they this isn't the only thing that they're doing right. We talk about early specialization and you know the, some of the um, the the dangers of that and of you know creating your entire identity as a tennis player but i think one of the differences when when working with certain adults is that they maybe are more secure in their identity in certain ways and that it's built upon other things it might be built upon them in their professional life for them um in regards to their family um or in their relationships or as a tennis player as an athlete um as a performer in general so i think um yes i've, I've i would i would say I've, I've shared that experience and have have noticed that um in terms of you know finding some some people that are highly motivated and highly driven towards achievement um there are definitely many adults um who have that that who you know are, are, are very high on, on that um but the, the goals look different it's not you know, if somebody's in their fifties or sixties, it's not to become a professional player. It might be a certain ranking um, at the national level or at the sectional level or at, at the ladder at the club, um, trying to become the, you know, one of the top players at the club. And what does that mean? You know, what is, what does that mean? What would that look like if you were to, if you were to get to that point? Okay. Um, you know, and then thinking about thinking backwards from that point. Um, through what we've talked about, through those process goals, um, those performance goals, those those systems in place that would need to be there in, in order to be one of the top players at the club, in order to be one of the top players in your region or in the country or whatever, um, whatever you're setting out towards. But ultimately, those people are very intrinsically motivated, meaning it, you know, they're the ones, you know, the, the goal for them, the reward for them is becoming better is yep. improvement. And so it reminds me of one of the classic theories of motivation, self-determination theory, and the whole idea of the basic, that we all have basic psychological needs there. And one of those is the idea of mastery or competence, that we all have this psychological need to be good at things and to work towards becoming a master at something. And so you know, the people in your class whether they know it or not, are really operating from that place. They have decided that tennis is one of those things where they would like to pursue mastery, and it's important to them, and that that pursuit in itself is the motivator. Maybe, yeah, there's a national ranking involved, but um, my guess is for that person who, who has set that particular outcome goal, if he or she achieves it, it doesn't mean the end. 
that that person will probably keep going, right? Because the pursuit is more is more internal and intrinsic. It's not driven by something outside or some outside reward. It's something that they really want to do. Um, and so I think that that's something to consider. You know, when Josh and I talk about the idea of becoming the best that you can become, we're really tapping into that piece that we all have this basic psychological need to feel competent. It's important to us and to pursue mastery in certain elements of our lives. Um, We do that in many contexts, um, but for all of us, we've also chosen tennis to be one of those contexts. And that can be a really great motivator if you tap into it, if you understand that and then buy into it and treat it as uh, a big driver of what you want to do within the sport and then let sort of everything else fall into place to help meet that psychological need. Um, I think that that's a great way to begin to, perf- you know, to, to approach how you want to get better. And I think that's probably what you're seeing with the people in your class. Yes. Yes. No, I, I would, I would definitely, definitely agree that, um, you know, the, the ultimate goal is, is mastery is, is trying to become, um, you know, all that you can be. And and that's going to look a little bit different for each person um, based on, you know, a whole host of factors, um, age, ability level, physical, you know, level injuries, um, technique, all all sorts of different things, self-belief, you know, um, but with with that as the goal, with that mastery piece and with that, um, you know, trying to, play at a, play at a high level, you know, perform well as the goal, then, you know, having, having some of these ambitious goals along the way or ambitious milestones along the way, we could, I'll rephrase yeah. uh, for, for some people can be, a, can be a motivating factor where for others that, that can, you know, they, they may have that, that mindset um, of, you know, constantly thinking about that gap as, as we talked about. Um, so I guess as, you know, as, as we start, start to wrap this up, um, Brian, what would you, if you were to point at one or two, um, plans that are out there, um, in, in terms of things that, that people can access and, and utilize within their own games, um, or maybe if there are some parents listening within their, their kid, you know, helping their kids or, um, what, what are some resources that, that you would point towards? Um, I think one thing that to help people understand the whole mastery thing, there's a great book by a guy named George Leonard. I think it's just called Mastery. Um, And it may come off as a little bit Zen-ish in some ways, but it's great perspective on how and why we should pursue mastery over other things. And, you know, I think the way you just phrased it, Josh, instead of thinking about these outcome goals as goals per se, let's look at them as milestones on the journey there and understand that that the journey is is um, kind of moves along constantly we're always looking to to do that um and i guess the last thing i'd say about a plan is is really when i suggested people look at this for say the next three months i would say make four columns on a page column one who do you want to be at the end of the next three or four months column two the process goals which are the things that you want to focus on and or improve at, right about that, as related to your vision. Next, the performance goals, which then, of course, relates back to your process goals and to your vision. What are some potential performance goals that you can either achieve while playing or maybe there's some tests that you can run? And then the final column would be what are the systems you're going to put in place to help you do all of this. And that will incorporate much of what you're doing today, but perhaps there are gonna be some new things that go into it. Um, So for example, let's say you haven't really done much on an in-between point routine. Well, that might be something you're gonna work on more in practices, or I am gonna work on my my in-between point routine, um, you know, certain, every time I play a match. You know, match play should be in your your systems and routines and and so forth. you, know, you may not get it perfect the first time. Remember, I did this plan for the first time some years ago. Um, but every time I did it thereafter, it was easier to do. You know, 
as you said, Josh, there's a reflection and an adjustment period. You can kind of do a stop, start, continue exercise with every facet of your training. Um, and it will only make your planning um, and uh, achievement process even better. So those, I think, are a couple things I would want to leave with everybody. What about you? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's definitely helpful. I would I would point to the the USTA development plan, which we could um, cer- certainly link to in the show notes. Um, and I, I think it's also important, and, and we've talked about this in the past, is that there are different plans out there, but you know it can be important to tailor it yourself to to figure out um, you know certain pieces. Maybe the nutrition piece is something that you really want to focus on. So maybe um, that's something that has, you know, you're including more within that plan, or maybe it's, um, you know, a certain, a, a, a certain part of the preparation process that um, maybe you feel that you've, um, or aren't dedicating as much time towards. So including a piece of preparation within that, that development plan um, in terms of, okay, how am I on a day-to-day basis? How am I preparing myself, but also thinking about how am I planning out my week or how am I planning out um, my, my performance in general. So, you know, putting in that extra piece, whatever, whatever it may be, but tailoring it to you and to your specific needs, I think is, is definitely an important piece. Yeah. So to conclude, I would say if, if people have questions or thoughts on goal setting, feel free to email us at tennis IQ podcast at gmail.com. Uh, even if you want to send us your plans, we'd be happy to take a look at those and uh, and help you out through through that process. So that's our show for today, and, and thank you for listening. For more on today's show, please check out the show notes. We made a bunch of references that we'll put into, into there. If you have any feedback or questions, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check out our Instagram account for new notifications. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.